as we transition from week three to week four, or final week of this course, we are also going to make an important transition in our study and understanding of the US-China geopolitical contest. So far, we've been trying to understand why in some ways this contest was inevitable. Now, we're going to understand why this major contest remains avoidable. No geopolitical collision is unavoidable. This is the major lesson I learned after practicing diplomacy for 33 years in the Singapore Diplomatic Service. Indeed, I have seen major geopolitical adversaries make U-turns and walk away from contests, often bitter contests. Let me mention two examples. The first involves Vietnam and its ASEAN neighbours. After Vietnam's illegal invasion of Cambodia in December 1978, ASEAN condemned it. ASEAN led a global campaign in the UN to criticise this occupation. I played a small role as I was Singapore's ambassador to the UN from 1984 to 1989. Eventually, our campaign succeeded. Vietnam withdrew from Cambodia in 1989 and signed the Paris Peace Agreement in 1991. The adversarial relationship between ASEAN and Vietnam could have remained. Instead, both sides made U-turns and normalised relations. Quite amazingly, Vietnam later joined ASEAN in 1995. In contrast to the European Union's poor management of its relations with Russia after the end of the Cold War, ASEAN did a much better job. Similarly, China and Vietnam developed a bitter adversarial relationship after Vietnam's invasion of Cambodia. Indeed, both countries fought a major war in February 1979 with hundreds of thousands of soldiers involved. Yet, after Vietnam withdrew from Cambodia, both Vietnam and China made U-turns and the China-Vietnam border, once among the most heavily mined and fortified borders in the world, became one of the most heavily traded borders in the world. By contrast, India and Pakistan whose last major border war was in 1971, have still not normalised trade relations. In short, there are positive and negative examples of geopolitical adversaries overcoming bitter historical divisions. This is why, in the year 2020, when America and China are at a significant fork in the road, in determining whether to proceed or avoid their geopolitical contest, they should be acutely aware that this contest can be avoided. In the next few video sessions, I will explain how it can be avoided. Yet, before leaving the case for the inevitability of the contest, let me highlight three key strategic mistakes that are driving the inevitability side of the equation. Two of the mistakes are made by America, one is made by China. I'm highlighting them because it is theoretically possible for both sides to make U-turns away from their mistakes. The first strategic mistake made by America was to focus on privacy over people. The various American decision makers, many of whom remain anonymous in the deep state, who have decided to launch a geopolitical contest against China without first looking out the strategy, have obviously decided that retaining America's number one status as a global power is more important than improving the well-being of the American people. Hence, at a time when the average income of the bottom 50% of the American people 
has not improved over several decades, as documented earlier. Instead of cutting the U.S. defense budget and transferring resources to help the poor in America who are truly suffering, America is doing the opposite. It is boosting the U.S. defense budget. On 16 September 2020, the then U.S. Defense Secretary announced an ambitious plan to expand the U.S. Navy from 293 ships to more than 355 ships. The U.S. Defense Secretary Mark Esper explained why. He said, quote, I want to make clear that China cannot match the United States when it comes to naval power. We must stay ahead. We must retain our overmatch. And we will keep building modern ships to ensure that we remain the world's greatest navy, unquote. If George Kennan, the great American strategist, were alive today, he would heartily disapprove of this move. He would have recommended that America strengthen its society, not its navy, to win any geopolitical contest. The well-being of the American people is more important than the primacy of America in the world. Yet no American administration can make a U-turn away from increased defense spending. The second strategic mistake of America is to put ideology ahead of pragmatism in justifying the increased negative moves against China, like closing down the Chinese consulate in Houston in July 2020. The US Secretary of State Pompeo declared that communist China was the central threat of our times. Yet, as this course has documented, China is no longer exporting communism. In standing up to communist China, Pompeo is standing up to a non-existent threat. America can live pragmatically at peace with a China that does not export communism. Instead of being pragmatic, America has decided to be ideological. This too is unwise. China too has made strategic mistakes. It has put pride ahead of pragmatism. Having published the Nine Dash Line of the South China Sea, China cannot walk away from it, even though if Deng Xiaoping were alive today, he would have pragmatically walked away from a Nine Dash Line that has become a strategic liability for China. Why is it a liability? Firstly, as documented by major international law scholars, it violates the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, that China has signed and ratified. Secondly, the Nine Dash Line has generated distrust and tension between China and its ASEAN neighbors. Thirdly, even though China has legitimate defense and naval interests in the South China Sea, these interests can be defended and protected without having a nine dash line. Fourthly, as the world's largest trading power, it is not in China's larger national interests to create a nine dash line precedent in the South China Sea that other powers might replicate in other regions. China's interests in open sea lanes globally are more important than its primacy in the South China Sea. Hence, there are solid reasons why China should make a clever U-turn away from the Nine Dash Line. However, pride will prevent China from being pragmatic. In short, Mistakes made by both America and China have led to their geopolitical contest becoming inevitable. Yet, as we will document in the next few videos, this is also a geopolitical contest which is eminently avoidable. The American Declaration of Independence of July 4, 1776 
is one of the most beautifully written documents. It also contains some key pieces of wisdom. One says that America should show a decent respect to the opinions of mankind. So what are the opinions of mankind on this US-China geopolitical contest? At the end of the day, the positions taken by the other 191 other countries in the world will also determine the outcome of this contest. America won the Cold War handsomely against the Soviet Union because it had many strong allies, including the most successful economies in the world, like the European Union and Japan, and key third world countries like Egypt, Pakistan, and Indonesia. By contrast, in the current contest, neither America nor China have any enthusiastic allies supporting it. Both America and China will be tempted to use their sturdy geopolitical muscles to cajole, bribe, pressure, and untwist other countries to join its side. This is normal superpower behavior. However, the capacity of other countries to resist such pressures has also grown. Each country or even region will either choose sides or stay neutral on the basis of their own interests. Now, in theory, countries make geopolitical decisions rationally. In practice, personalities matter too. The sharp contrast between Obama and Trump brings this out. When he was president, Obama was also concerned about China's rise. He therefore tried to block American allies from joining China's initiative to set up the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB. Obama failed to stop the UK from joining. Similarly, Trump has tried to block American allies from letting in Huawei. Initially, the UK refused to accede to American wishes. A senior British personality told me in Davos in January 2020 that the UK would never capitulate to American pressures. Yet, by July 2020, the UK had capitulated and announced a ban on Huawei. Trump could bully, Obama could not. This story of British capitulation to American pressure is important for another reason. In the Cold War against the Soviet Union, the British were enthusiastic American allies. Today, there's no such enthusiasm in the UK to join America wholeheartedly. The British have their own interests to protect. London's status as a global financial centre will be severely damaged if it cannot trade Chinese RMB. Therefore, most countries will make decisions carefully on the basis of shrewd calculations of their own long-term interests, although emotions will play a role too. Let us begin by studying the attitudes of two key allies of America, the European Union, EU, and Japan. Their final decisions will be a result of complex long-term calculations. Chapter 8 of Has China Won tries to draw out the complexity. In this brief video, we can only provide a relatively simple analysis. To put it simply, the EU will be torn between its head and its heart. As a fellow member of the Western civilization, European hearts are clearly aligned with America And the Europeans also remember how generous America was to Europe, especially after World War II. But there's a second emotional factor. Even though many Europeans will deny this, they're also subconsciously affected by the fear of the yellow peril. Indeed, the yellow peril fear was generated in Europe, not America, after the Mongols almost conquered Europe in the 13th century. Yet, If the Europeans were to do brutal, hard-headed calculations of where the next big threat to Europe is going to come from, they will realize that it will not come from Russian or Chinese military threats. Instead, it's going to come from the demographic explosion in Africa. In 1950, the EU's combined population was nearly double that of Africa's. Today, Africa's population is double that of the EU countries. By 2100, Africa's population is projected to be almost 10 times larger. 
4.5 billion versus 493 million. Now, from 2015 to 2017, there was a surge of migrants from Africa and the Middle East to Europe. This had a dramatic effect on European politics, with traditional centrist parties losing ground to populist parties. The real fear that most ordinary Europeans feel is that their continent will be overtaken by foreign migrants, especially from Africa. Now, what's the best way to prevent such migration from Africa? The only way is to promote economic development in Africa. Which country is the best partner for this? The answer is China. China is by far the largest new investor in Africa. This therefore captures the European dilemma. Their hearts will draw them closer to America. Their heads will calculate that they should work with China. Japan, as a long-time neighbour of China, faces a different dilemma. Japan and China have had a complicated relationship, especially from the Sino-Japanese War of 1895 to the end of World War II in 1945. Japan's brutal invasion and occupation of Chinese territory from 1937 to 1945 has not been forgotten by the Chinese people. At the same time, as the Harvard professor Ezra Vogel has documented, for most of the past 1,000 years, China and Japan have lived in peace with each other. All this brings out Japan's security dilemma. Given its troubled relationship with China, it needs to rely on American protection. Yet even though America and Japan have been allies since 1960, they are not close to each other. The Japanese felt betrayed when President Nixon visited Beijing without informing Japan in 1972. The Japanese were also brutally arm-twisted by the Reagan administration to revalue their currency after the Plaza Accords of 1985. This led to decades of economic stagnation in Japan. A former National Security Advisor, Brent Scowcroft, has written that Japan was, quote, probably the most difficult country, unquote, America had to deal with. In short, there isn't much real trust between America and Japan. In theory, China will be better off to see an end of the US-Japan defense alliance. In practice, China would be worse off. A Japan without American military protection would have to acquire nuclear weapons of its own. This would be against Chinese interests. Hence, paradoxically, as Kissinger told Zhou Enlai in 1971, China should encourage Japan to retain its security alliance with the US as it will prevent Japan from acquiring nuclear weapons. In short, as demonstrated by the cases of the EU and Japan, geopolitical calculations are very complex. There are no simple black and white answers. This complexity will also surface in the next video when we discuss the cases of Australia, India and ASEAN, three key players in the Sino-American geopolitical contest. Australia will have to make the most painful adjustment in dealing with a Sino-American geopolitical contest. Much of the pain will be self-inflicted as Australia refuses to accept that geography is destiny. As the wise Australian scholar Hugh White wrote, quote, it seems as if we are still clinging to the idea that America will remain the dominant power in Asia, that will be there to shield us from China, and that China can somehow be convinced happily to accept this. It is a triumph for wishful thinking of a serious policy." Unquote. The paradox here is that Australia's geopolitical pain today is a result of Australia having been an excessively lucky country on three counts. First, despite its geographic proximity to China, it was discovered and settled by British, not Chinese migrants 
Captain Arthur Phillip arrived in 1788. Therefore, for ethnic and cultural reasons, Australia enjoyed being a member of the globally dominant Western club. Sadly, this led to it developing a culture of condescension, often expressed in private, towards its Asian neighbours. Second, when China's economy exploded over several decades, from 1980 onwards, Australia became one of the main beneficiaries since China bought massive natural resources from Australia. Functionally, Australia had become a province of China, but Australians didn't notice. Thirdly, Australia could have experienced a troubled neighbourhood since Southeast Asia was known as the Balkans of Asia. Instead, Southeast Asia developed ASEAN, the second most successful regional organisation in the world, therefore providing Australia a valuable geopolitical buffer. A wise Australian government could have and should have taken advantage of these three streams of luck to reposition itself in a changed geopolitical environment. Instead, recent Australian governments have done the opposite. In my book, Has the West Lost It? I document that the artificial 200-year period of Western domination of world history is coming to an end. As geography is destiny, Australia will have to leave the Western club and join the Asian club. Culturally, it refuses to do so. Even more unwisely, Australia has provoked and alienated its main economic partner, China. Unless Australia changes course, it will continue to experience pain from the US-China contest. In contrast to Australia, India could have enjoyed a magnificent geopolitical opportunity when the Sino-American geopolitical contest broke out. As the third largest power in the world, it could have positioned itself in the middle. If you can imagine America and China sitting at two ends of a seesaw, India could have enhanced its geopolitical leverage by standing in the middle. Until June 15, 2020, that was the geopolitical direction India seemed to be headed to. Sadly, on June 15, 2020, there was a violent clash between Indian and Chinese soldiers. Several soldiers died. Indian public opinion became inflamed against China. A series of anti-China actions followed. India banned many Chinese mobile apps. The emotional reactions of Indians to the loss of lives at the border were perfectly understandable. Yet one of the oldest rules of geopolitics is that countries which react emotionally instead of calmly and rationally tend to suffer. Many Indians believe that India can punish China by moving closer to America. Well, America would benefit from this, just as it successfully fought the Soviet Union to the last Afghan, it would gain by fighting China to the last Indian. The question is how would India benefit from this? Now, many forces will drive India and America closer to each other. Their fellow democracies, the ethnic Indian community is extraordinarily successful in America. Yet, under Trump, America also became a selfish country. Even though Trump was close to PM Modi, he removed the special trade preferences, known as the generalized system of preferences, from India in June 2019 and suspended H-1B visas which benefited Indians most in June 2020. In real terms, Trump's actions against India were more economically damaging than China's actions. There is a real danger that America could turn even more isolationist and protectionist it would therefore be wiser for India to return to a middle position between America and China, difficult as this may be for Indians to accept. In contrast to both Australia and India, ASEAN has succeeded 
in maintaining good relations with both China and America. This is no small accomplishment. Among the 10 member states of ASEAN, some are pro-China like Cambodia and some are pro-America like Vietnam. Yet despite this, ASEAN has managed to walk a tight rope within America and China. As my co-author Jeffrey Sung and I document in the ASEAN Miracle, this is a result of decades of wise management by ASEAN leaders. Indonesia injected its culture of consultation and consensus of Mushawara and Mufakat into ASEAN. ASEAN has succeeded by being pragmatic. It compromises when necessary. With the explosion of the Sino-American geopolitical contest, ASEAN faces both a moment of great danger and great opportunity. The danger is clear. Both China and America could try to force ASEAN countries to choose sides. This would be unwise. A broken ASEAN will serve neither American nor Chinese interests. Indeed, unknown to many Americans, including American leaders, there are still huge reservoirs of goodwill towards America and Southeast Asia. Wise American diplomacy could enhance these reservoirs. Similarly, there's a strong desire among all ASEAN countries to continue close cooperation with China, especially since the fast-growing Chinese economy has become the main engine of growth in East Asia. This is why all 10 ASEAN countries, unlike India, continue to remain members of RCEP. ASEAN also provides China a special opportunity. At a time when relations within China and many countries, including Australia, India and some European countries, have soured, China can point to its close relations with ASEAN countries to demonstrate that China can be a valuable and trusted partner or developing countries. No other successful region can be used as a role model by China. Hence, it is in China's interest to show extraordinary diplomatic dexterity as well as economic generosity in managing its relations with ASEAN. The rewards could be significant for both parties. The one big lesson I have learned in life is that common sense is not common at all. <laughs> Indeed, it's very uncommon. The dynamic of the US-China geopolitical contest confirms this. We have studied the forces driving both powers towards this contest. Yet common sense will demonstrate clearly that both sides can and should avoid this contest. Since many thoughtful people believe that the differences between America and China are irreconcilable, I have introduced the concept of non-contradictions to explain why in five critical areas there are non-contradictions between America and China. The first area is in human welfare and well-being. What should be the primary objective of any government? Thomas Jefferson a great founding father of America, answered this question well. In March 1809, he wrote, quote, The care of human life and happiness, and not their destruction, is the first and only legitimate object of good government, unquote. The leaders of China would agree with Jefferson. If the governments of America and China were to make the care of human life and happiness their primary goals, there will be a non-contradiction between both governments in this area. Indeed, there will be good reasons for them to cooperate. Here is an example of a concrete area where they can cooperate. America is suffering from a serious infrastructure deficit. China has emerged as an infrastructure superpower it builds among the fastest train networks in the world. The Amtrak train from New York to Miami takes 
30 hours. <laughs> a similar train ride in China would take less than eight hours. If America and China were two sensible companies, instead of competing countries, they would realize that cooperating in building high-speed trains would be a win-win proposition. Indeed, this is pure common sense. George Cannon would probably advise fellow Americans to cooperate with China if we were alive today. In agreement with the spirit of Thomas Jefferson's comment, Cannon believed that American governments should focus on improving the spiritual vitality of American society, not external adventures. Hence, if America were to heed the views of its wisest thinkers like Jefferson and Cannon, it would come to realize that it should focus on improving the well-being of its people. And one good way to do so is through cooperating with China. Secondly, there is a non-contradiction between America and China in handling common global challenges like COVID-19 and global warming. Indeed, there's a convergence of interests. A simple boat metaphor will explain how radically the world has changed. Before globalization, when 7.7 .7 billion people lived in 193 separate countries, it was as though they were living in separate boats. Now, 7.7 .7 billion people live in 193 separate cabins on the same boat. This is the metaphysical message that COVID-19 is trying to send to us. COVID-19 was clearly like a fire that had spread through our entire global boat. Now, what is the stupidest thing that two passengers can do when the boat that they are on catches fire? It would be to argue about who started the fire. Yet this is exactly what America and China did. Simple common sense would have dictated that the two passengers should set aside their differences and focus on putting out the fire to save the boat. This example again illustrates how uncommon common sense is. Fortunately, there is now a growing global consensus that humanity now lives on a small and endangered planet. The melting of ice caps and glaciers in the Arctic and Antarctic, the raging forest fires in Australia and California, the increasing climate disruptions are sending clear signals that our planet is in peril. As many leaders are warning us, Pope Francis says, quote, human-induced climate change is a scientific reality and its decisive mitigation is a moral and religious imperative for humanity, unquote. Obama says, quote, we are the first generation to feel the effect of climate change and the last generation who can do something about it, unquote. One fact is undeniable. If humanity were to destroy planet Earth, it has no other planet to migrate to. Common sense would dictate that all of humanity, especially the two leading powers, America and China, should cooperate to save planet Earth. The third non-contradiction is in a surprising area, ideology. This statement will be hugely contested by many leading Americans. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo clearly emphasized that China's communist ideology is a threat to democracy, saying, quote, securing our freedoms from the Chinese Communist Party is the mission of our time. And America is perfectly positioned to lead it because our founding principles give us that opportunity, unquote. Pompeo warned of the dangers of communism. Now, the three largest democracies in the world in terms of population size are India, 1.3 billion, America, 330 million, 
and Indonesia 250 million. If Chinese communism was a threat to democracies, the Indian and Indonesian democracies should feel more threatened since they're geographically closer to China. Yet, if we were to ask PM Modi of India or President Jokowi of Indonesia if they feel that their democracies are threatened by Chinese communism, they will be puzzled. They are certainly concerned by the rise of Chinese power. However, they see no ideological threat since they know China stopped exporting communism to its fellow Asian neighbours over 40 years ago after Deng Xiaoping visited Southeast Asia in 1978. By focusing on communist ideology as the threat, American strategic thinkers are making the same mistake as the British did in Singapore in World War II. The British anticipated a naval attack from Japan and pointed their guns south. Instead, the Japanese came overland on bicycles from the north. The classic mistake here was to point the guns in the wrong direction. Similarly, by portraying communism as the threat, America fails to understand the real challenge from China. It is the dynamism and productivity of Chinese society, not Chinese communism. If Cannon were alive today, he would advise his fellow Americans to strengthen the spiritual vitality of America to compete successfully with China. Instead of wasting precious resources on a non-existent ideological threat from China, America should use its resources to revitalize its own society. In the next video, we'll explore two more non-contradictions in civilization and in values. The final non-contradiction within America and China is in the area of civilizations and values. This could come as a shock to many American thought leaders who see a fundamental incompatibility, especially within the values of American and Chinese societies. To explain this non-contradiction, it may be useful to understand how values emerge. In theory, they emerge as mental ideas that pop out of our heads. In practice, the values we believe in also emerge as a result of our historical and geographical circumstances. Indeed, both history and geography explain well the different value systems of America and China. American history began with a revolt against the tyrannical monarchical regime of King George III. Hence, the new settlers from Europe emphasized the importance of individual freedoms. Individual freedoms were also given a boost by the lucky geography of America. The wide open spaces of the North American continent allowed individuals to grow and thrive without social constraints. Hence, Freedom became a cherished ideal. However, it must also be emphasized that the white founding fathers of America didn't extend freedom to the black slave community, nor did it hinder the effective genocide of the American Indian population. This is not surprising. All societies respect their values imperfectly. Chinese values are also influenced by the history and geography. China is the world's oldest continuous civilization. Yet, in this long history of almost 5,000 years, 20 times as long as American history, 
The Chinese people have experienced disunity and division more often than order and stability. Order and stability have also been associated with strong central rule from the capital. As a result, in the cultural DNA of Chinese society, there is a strong preference for order and stability, especially of the kind that the Chinese people have enjoyed over the past 40 years. Similarly, Chinese geography also favours greater emphasis on order and stability. The American ambassador Chas Freeman explains well this relevance of geography. This is what he says, quote, China is slightly larger than the United States, but there are 1.4 billion Chinese with only one third the arable land and one fourth the water we Americans have. If we had the same ratio of population to agricultural resources that the Chinese do, there would be almost 4 billion Americans. I suspect that if there were that many people crammed into the United States, Americans would have a much lower tolerance for social disorder." Unquote. Ambassador Freeman is right. The tight geographical confines that the Chinese people are caught in also leads to a greater desire for social order and stability. Many Americans are inherently skeptical of such claims. Indeed, many Americans, including well-informed and thoughtful Americans, believe that the Chinese people today are caught in a Soviet-style gulag, imprisoned in their societies. But as demonstrated in our earlier discussions, there's ample evidence that the Chinese people are not trapped in a Soviet-style gulag. Instead, as confirmed by a thorough and rigorous academic study done by the Ash Center of the Harvard Kennedy School, support for the Chinese Communist Party has increased in recent years from 86% in 2003 to 93% in 2016. All Americans who believe that the Chinese people are suffering from lack of freedom should ponder on one statistic. Each year, except in 2020, over 100 million Chinese leave China freely. Each year, they all return home freely. Why are they returning home freely? Still, there is no doubt that there is a fundamental incompatibility between American values that emphasize individual freedoms and Chinese values that emphasize social order and stability. How can there be a non-contradiction if the values are incompatible? The answer is simple. American values work well for American society. Chinese values work well for Chinese society. Hence, both sides would be better off if they respected the decisions of each society to choose their own values. Both societies will also have to live with the consequences of their choices. COVID-19 has shown the results of their choices. As the Chinese people were prepared to accept tighter restrictions and lockdowns, only 86,000 Chinese people got infected with 4,634 Chinese people dying. Since the American people were reluctant to accept restrictions, with President Trump flagrantly violating common sense rules of social distancing, as of November 1st, 2020, over 9 million American people were infected with over 200,000 dead Americans. One statistic is telling if the American population suffered the same rate of fatalities as the Chinese population, Americans would have had just over 1,000 deaths instead of over 200,000 deaths. It's clear values have consequences.
in short, the wisest course for both American and Chinese societies to follow is to understand that both history and geography have led to their different societies making different choices in their values. Even if one looks at the famous Four Freedoms of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, it is clear that for American people, freedom of speech and religion was more important. While for the Chinese people, freedom from want and fear were more important. Incidentally, when FDR referred to freedom from fear, he was referring to the fear of being killed in wars. Having experienced more foreign invasions than America has, the Chinese people value this freedom highly. Many Americans believe that their values are superior and the best in the world. They may well be right. However, only time will tell. The best way for America to sell its values is to demonstrate how it is creating the world's best society. In short, a shining city on the hill. Sadly, America is no longer a shining city on the hill. Hence, if both Americans and Chinese could become more modest about their values and respect each other's choices, America and China could live in peace with each other. There would be a non-contradiction in values too. All good things must come to an end. So too must this course. This will be our last video. So let me close the course with three concluding reflections. The first is on the election of Joe Biden as President of the US. As I said in the first video, a paradox surrounds his election. On the one hand, everything will change. Unlike Trump, he will be a calm, stable and rational actor. Unlike the Trump administration, his administration will not insult China. A civil dialogue will begin between US and China. On the other hand, nothing will change. As we have explained in this course, a rock-solid consensus has developed in the American body politic that the time has come for America to stand up to China. So over the next few years, when you read newspaper headlines about some new source of misunderstanding or tension within America and China, you will understand why it is happening. This cause has spelled out the structural forces driving this contest. My second reflection is for students of this cause who are not Americans or Chinese. Again, as I've explained in this course, the 6 billion people who live outside America and China should not be passive bystanders or innocent victims if this US-China geopolitical contest accelerates in the coming decades and does damage to global peace and stability and to global economic growth. They should speak out loudly and clearly and call on both sides to take into consideration the interests of other countries before plunging into this contest. So what can they say to pressure America and China to change course? This brings me to my third reflection. The time has clearly come for the more thoughtful voices among the six billion to join the more thoughtful voices in both America and China in calling on these two countries to take new directions that will be beneficial to both the American and Chinese people and the 6 billion outside. The new directions can come in the form of three steps. The first step is to press the pause button on the US-China geopolitical contest. Simple common sense will dictate why we should do this. Just imagine 
if we were all passengers on a boat that had just caught fire, what would be the stupidest thing we could do as passengers? It would be to argue about who started the fire instead of cooperating immediately to put out the fire. Sadly, this is exactly what the Trump administration did. Instead of cooperating immediately with China to put out a fire, COVID-19, which threatened all passengers, the Trump administration started an argument about who started the fire. The more thoughtful voices on planet Earth can therefore speak out now in unison and try to persuade the Biden administration and the leaders of China to at least pause the geopolitical contest until COVID-19 is completely eliminated. Indeed, most of humanity would react with great joy if such a step was taken. The second step is to emphasize the far greater common challenges that humanity faces together. Fortunately, the Biden administration, unlike the Trump administration, acknowledges that climate change is real and is likely to rejoin the Paris Climate Accord. Indeed, there is growing evidence that we will do irreparable damage to planet Earth if we don't stop global warming. Most climate experts agree that our fragile planetary environmental system will suffer greatly if global temperatures rise 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. This is why the Paris Accord aims to keep the global temperature rise well below 2 degrees and ideally below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Renowned naturalist Sir David Attenborough has warned that unless the world's leaders take action now, the collapse of our civilizations and the extinction of much of the natural world is on the horizon. Many of you would have read my book, Has China Won by Now? In the second last paragraph of the book, I say, humans would look pityingly at two tribes of apes that continued fighting over territory while the forest around them was burning. But this is how America and China will appear to future generations if they continue to focus on their differences while the earth is facing an extended moment of great peril. This is why I'm filming this video now against the backdrop of this magnificent painting by the Indonesian artist Raden Saleh. His burning forest captures well where humanity is at now. Let us work together to stamp out global warming. The third step is to transform the geopolitical competition between America and China away from the zero-sum military sphere to the positive-sum economic sphere. By now, it is clear that Chinese society is not going to become a replica of American society. Many Americans who believe that China would soon become a liberal democracy like America should give up their wishful thinking and acknowledge and accept that the Chinese people have chosen a different path. Economic competition is also not a zero-sum game. It can be win-win. Hence, if both America and China compete to show that their systems are better to improve the well-being of their people, both their peoples will benefit, so too will the rest of the world. Here's one statistic to explain how the rest of the world can benefit. In 2009, the size of the retail goods market in China was $1.8 trillion, while that of the US was $4 trillion, almost double. Ten years later, by 2019, China's had grown to $6 trillion, while that of the US rose to $5.5 trillion. 
By increasing the sizes of their retail goods markets, they benefited both their own people and the peoples of the rest of the world. Now, the fight against climate change presents the US and China with the opportunity to create new technologies and products that will reduce the world's CO2 emissions. Sheer common sense dictates that both countries find more intelligent means to manage their geopolitical competition. I sincerely hope that this course has directly or indirectly suggested how both countries and the rest of the world will be better off if they try new directions. Thank you.